This video contains spoilers for The Wheel of Time Season 2, Episode 5. Episode 4, Damane, written by Rohit Kumar, directed by Maya Vervilo. We cold open on the Shanshan fleet returning to Fom. Lady Surath, accompanied by Alwyn, Ishamael, and their brand new slaves, Loyal and Ingtar, are brought before High Lord Turok, who is pissed that Surath conquered a town that was too far away for them to hold. For her punishment, she is barred from the council until she is once again presentable, and her long fingernails are ceremonially chopped off, which garners a horrified reaction from the assembled Shonshin. The now disgraced Surath is dismissed, and Ishamael takes the opportunity to present Turok with the Horn of Alir, which is carried in by, cue the whistling, Pad and Fane. Turok is greatly pleased. Rand and Moraine book it through the woods because they're in a horror movie now. Back up in the cabin, Lanfear mutters, bitch. While black dots fill her eyes, she channels black weaves to heal herself, and she is after them. Rand and Moraine find a stable and take off with the horses, along with the female stable master. Before leaving, Moraine kills an extra horse because she is on a throat-slitting roll tonight. Lanfear can't use that dead horse, but she can explode a nice old man's head clear off his body and take his. Oh, it was great. Still traveling with Elias, Perrin uses his slowly changing wolf eyes to notice Elias has taken him back toward Atuan's mill instead of after the caravan. Elias tries to tell him his friends and even his wife are not his pack. When Perrin yells, the wolves gather around because they are thirsty for drama. <laughs> Perrin decides <laughs> against Sorry. taking them all on wise decision, and leaves to help his friends, with Hopper whining as he goes. Rand and Moraine pull the second most popular trope in fiction and hide off to the side of the road as Lanfear rides past. Moraine finally tells him what's going on, re the eye of the world, and the Forsaken being freed. Rand turns with tears in his eyes. He misses Celine and his life is terrible. Someone hug him. Hopper follows after Perrin and tries to push him back toward Atuan's mill. Perrin sees a vision of Uno dead in a cage and decides to head back to bury him. I mean, Uno literally could not care less about his status right now, but you do you, Perrin. <laughs> he sneaks back into the town and sees not only Uno's body in a cage, but the bodies of some Shanshan soldiers and a living female Aiel. A man approaches and warns Perrin off from her, although he gives her some water. He tells Perrin he has to stay due to the curfew, and brings him to the inn. He recognizes Perrin as being from the two rivers. Suddenly, Perrin notices some familiar garb on the other men, and under his new friend's cloak as well, white cloaks. In the inn, Perrin finds out the previous innkeeper followed her granddaughter, who was taken by the Shanshan, but the new innkeeper preferred the Shanshan to the white cloaks. Same. Outside, our old friend, Child Valda, who is still wearing a sling on his arm due to Egwene's backstab, tells the new guy, Dane Bornhall, to stop giving the Aiel water and says he will continue to question her. Dane mocks him about still being afraid of wolves. Lanfear comes across the stable master. We find out Moraine had her take the horses to draw Lanfear off the trail. To make sure she doesn't tell anyone what's going on, Lanfear uses the power to sew her mouth shut. It's better than an exploded head, I guess. Varen returns to her brown Aja friends in the White Tower, Yasaka and Naomi. They have some drinks and want to hear what Varen's been up to, but Varen's only interested in meeting these powerful novices she's heard so much about, and Egwene. Well, she'll have to wait. Ouch. Ouch. Because oh. Leandrin has the girls with her in the ways. They are knocked out, but Nynaeve wakes up first because she's Nynaeve. She realizes Leandrin broke the three oaths by attacking them, and Leandrin tells her that all those Aes Sedai rules are just to keep others from being too afraid of them. Leandrin wanted to recruit Nynaeve to the dark, but Nynaeve says she will never turn, no matter the price. Surath is hella pissed at Ashamael for making her go to Atuan's mill in the first place. She wants to kill Turok, but Ashamael is playing a long game. He knows why Surath swore her oaths to the dark, and suddenly her attitude softens. Ashamael says the last battle will happen in Falm, written in the skies, and the dragon will join them. After seeing Valda, Perrin knows it is time to exit, stage left even. On his way out of town, he frees the Aiel. Her name is Avienda, and her water is his, whatever that means. They're suddenly surrounded by white cloaks, including Dane, but not Valda, because he probably sensed a fight and went to hide somewhere. Dane obviously attended SNL Ninja School because he tells them to make sure to attack her all at once or she'll <laughs> kill them. Guess what? She does anyway because she's a goddamn maiden of the spear and she likes to dance. Perrin grabs a hammer and does some damage too. He stops Avienda from finishing Dane off and they leave. Back in Carrienne, Maureen explains the world of dreams to Rand. Teleron Riyadh, have you heard of it? Lanfear can, 
Nan Fear can get them in their dreams. She's kind of like Freddy Krueger in that way. So no sleeping. You can do that, right, Rand? At Maureen's house, we meet Barthanis Damadred, Maureen's nephew and winner of Best Hair this season. <laughs> Barthanis is engaged to Queen Galdrian and hopes they can attend their wedding in a few weeks. Maureen and Rand plan to wash up and rest and then ride on. In Shiriam's study, Varen lets Shiriam know that Nynaeve and Egwene are nowhere to be found, as well as Elaine. Shiriam checks her book and sees the girls left to go to Camelin, accompanied by Andoran soldiers, and she can't believe it slipped her mind. When Varen and Shiriam leave the room, Yasika sneaks in and takes a closer look at that sign-out book. Back in the Brown Aja quarters, Yasika says the notation about the girls leaving had a slight tremor in the handwriting. Varen posits that maybe someone was using compulsion on Shiriam? Yasika does not like this idea at all because it means the Black Aja is real. A wake gate opens in the forest outside Fom, and Leandrin exits with the still unconscious girls. Suroth and a contingent of soldiers with Damane are waiting for her. Leandrin's mad that Ashamael didn't come himself. She hates Suroth and what the Shonchan do to channelers. Suroth says that all Marath Damani will be leashed eventually. Leandrin mumbles a threat and leaves, but not before waking all the girls. Nynaeve can't channel, so the other two take over, and they try to escape, but Egwene doesn't make it. Avienda gives Perrin a little Aiel lesson. She says she came looking for their Kara Karn, but now she has toe to Perrin for saving her life, so she will stay with him. They're heading to Vom. Nynaeve and Elaine arrive in the city that night and try to keep a low profile among the patrolling Shonchan guards. However, keeping a low profile is not Nynaeve's strong suit. So the girls get their heads knocked into a wall and they're unconscious again. I'm no doctor, but two concussions in two days is probably not very good. Varen confronts Leandrin back at the tower who also conveniently signed out at the same time as the girls for a totally unrelated reason. Varen tells her the girls left for Camelin and, oh no, Leandrin heard of a group of Andoran guards getting attacked. What if the girls are hurt? Moraine rubs her eyes and gazes lovingly at her pillows. As she cleans herself up, she has the closest thing possible to a heart-to-heart -heart with Enver. Maureen says her family and all of Kyrian is in danger, and Enver can tell she has no idea what to do next. She asks Moraine to think about what her biggest problem is protecting Rand, and whether it's really necessary. A light bulb suddenly goes off for Moraine. As Rand sleeps, we see a Shamael lying next to him in bed, caressing his face. But he knows Rand is really Lanfear, playing in his dreams. She reveals herself, and she's mastered a beautiful, smoky eye. They drink together and discuss the past, the other chosen, and their plans. You could cut the sexual tension with a knife. Ishamael says the Dark One only speaks to him because he is the only one who truly wants to stop the wheel. Lanfear only wants the dragon. Ishamael has been working on destroying Rand's friends so that he will break. Outside Teleron Riyadh, a slave awakens Ishamael to attend an audience with Turok. Turok wants to know who Ishamael is and how he has risen so high in the Shonchan court. Also, isn't he the guy who saw the omens that led them to begin their return in the first place? But no, according to Ishamael, only the Empress can see the omens for what they are. Turok says because he brought the horn, Ishamael can ask one thing of him, but he just wants Turok to accept an upcoming gift from Suroth in good faith. Nynaeve and Elaine awaken in beds. A man and woman approach them, but it's a yellow sister, Rima, and her warder. He can cuss them for their own protection. <laughs> Otherwise, they would be where Egwene is, being presented as a gift to Turok. She's in full Damani garb now and is collared and leashed before the court. Rand is hanging with Barthanis when Maureen says, time for bed. Lanfear could have heard him all this time, but she didn't. She loved the dragon, but he broke her heart and she turned to the dark to try to get him back. Rand needs to find out what she wants. Maureen says it's Rand's choice and she means it. And he decides to sleep. As soon as he's out, he's instantly in Teleron Riyadh, shirtless, strapped to a wheel in a desert. Lanfear sits before him on a throne wearing black bondage gear. This is going to be good. See you next week.